Welcome to today's episode of the Sports Generals here on the So What's the Catch Facebook page. Um, I am with my fellow count, my fellow generals. We got Brian Fraley to my right or to my left, depending on which way you're looking at the screen. And down, down there is Mr. Manolytics, as usual, Jason Vaughn. How you guys doing? Happy Thursday. Good. Good to be here. Sorry. Let me turn my notifications off. Real professional of me to start the show with an interruption. I know. What a great way to do it. That's class. I know. You're I'm such a good host, huh? <laughs> Sorry yeah, about you're, me, such a, you're such a good analyst, Brian. It's pros, oh, pro. pros, pro. I'm, I'm on do not disturb now, so we are good to go. Hey, speaking of uh, handling things like a professional, you know who's not doing that? <laughs> Aaron Rodgers and Ooh. Kyler Murray. Ooh. Totally. Is that what we're going to start with a little bit of a quarterback drama today? Yeah. Sound, it seems like a fun topic. Yeah. So. Why don't you set the table for everybody with the Kyler Murray situation for the people who don't know? So, basically, Kyler Murray unfollowed the Arizona Cardinals – from his social media pages, he basically wiped them off, and he wants a contract extension because his rookie deal is going to be up, I believe, next year, if I remember correctly. I will look that up just to double check. You're correct. Okay. And he wants a contract extension, but the Cardinals seem to be reluctant about the whole thing, and... There's a little bit more to this story that I actually want to touch on because despite Arizona struggling down the stretch the past few seasons, I'll say they stupidly gave contract extensions to general manager Steve Kime and their head coach, Cliff Kingsbury. Now, can either one of you help me wrap my mind around the fact these two guys got contract extensions. I mean, what did they do to get contract extensions? Yeah, so I, I know how you feel about Kingsbury because you've been very um, consistent with that. But he did get them to the playoffs last year. Big um, deal. But that's a big deal for them because they haven't been to the playoffs. So he's got them to the playoffs. They do perform. They have beat the Rams. They have success. It's just, you know, they fizzle out when you need them to be more productive. Like that hot start that they had. Mm -hmm. They were good at first, beginning of the season. But once people watched film on them, figured them out, it just went down the, down, down the hill. So uh, he did get them to the playoffs, though. And they haven't been to the playoffs in a while. So I think that's probably what merited that extension. And yeah, I think they were kind of living on the uh, the merit of that seven and zero start too. You know, they they kind of put too much stock into that. I think, mm -hmm. um, and when they made the decision to re-sign them, I think that their thinking is, well, we know what he's capable of. We know they're capable of a seven zero start. If they're capable of that, that means they're capable of doing more. Um, so I think that Jason's right. I think it's just a a matter of them, you know, being a mediocre franchise. And when you get a mediocre franchise to the postseason, you know, they tend to make a bigger deal out of that than it is sometimes. And in this case, um, I think that's why they re-signed both of them. But with the Kyler Murray situation, yeah, I, I think that he's not really in the best position to kind of leverage himself over the Cardinals like that. Like what he's done is alienated the fan base. You know, they can't be happy about the whole situation. Um, his play at the end of the season wasn't great, um, to put it kindly. Um, so, like, the timing of this is kind of mysterious for me, and it, it kind of screams desperation from Kyler's camp in my, in my eyes. I think he, he saw how he struggled down the stretch, and he's thinking about that next big contract, and he's worried that if he doesn't play great this year, that next contract might not look the way that it would look if he signed a new one now. Um, right. I, I think, think Kyler – Kyler believes he's in that class of quarterbacks with Josh Allen, Lamar, Patrick Mahomes. I'm trying. He I'm thinks on he the is. Fence. 
Yeah, I'm thinks, trying to. Uh, I'm on the fence about whether to put Stafford in that class as well or not. He just won Super Bowl. Okay, fair enough. So he's not on top of light, though. Kyler believes he's in that class of quarterbacks. I personally don't think he is, because I yeah, we talked about I this yes we talked about this yesterday on so what's the catch, Brian? Where guys who who are coached by Lincoln Riley go to the University of Oklahoma and are in the Big Twelve look better than they really are. Look right. at Baker Mayfield. Like we thought after he won the Heisman, he was going to be the saving grace here in Cleveland. At least mm-hmm. some of us did. And yeah, that the, has speed been- of the, game, the speed of the game in the NFL is just so much different. Um, and they play defense. So, <laughs> yeah, they have far less time, you know, to less time to get rid of the ball, less time to process the defense. Like everything is quicker in the NFL. Um, and also that Oklahoma offense that they both ran, like that lends itself to getting guys wide open. Like exactly. they, they create – they create separation. Like it, you don't get wide open like that in the NFL. The worst cornerback in the NFL is still, you know, a top flight cornerback in college. Yeah. Um, so it, everything is tighter. The windows are smaller, and the windows at a place like Oklahoma are wide open. So they make they make guys look a lot better than than they really are. I think Kyler um, Murray is probably this is camp. It's actually his agent. I think he's getting bad advice because. What he's probably looking at or the angle he's coming from is I'm a small quarterback. I'm injury prone. Josh Allen and those, they're bigger guys, so they can sustain the brutal contact that I can't. But um, I want long-term uh, guaranteed money. And he's only under contract for $5 million. I didn't even know that. And mm-hmm. that's, really, that's very cheap. But the way he's going about it, I think, is rubbing – his teammates the wrong way, his fan base the wrong way, and it's making him come off as the villain towards the media. Right. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'd still take this guy over Baker Mayfield. He's better than what oh, we have. Okay. But, but yeah, I think that he suffers from a lot of the same issues that Baker does. He's a smaller guy. Um, he's a guy that played in the same exact offense that Baker Mayfield played it in college. Um, so, you know, he, he was coming out of the same system. Um, and neither one of them has, has adjusted to the point that we thought they would, you know, but with Baker being a number one pick and Kyler being a first round pick, like you expect these guys to be great and neither one of them is. So. Yeah. It's unfortunate just because I feel like the fans are the, the, that that's the casualty of, or the collateral damage because they want to root for the kid, but if you followed him when he was in college at Oklahoma, he's had one of those type of, like, I don't know where you stand at with us type of attitude because he could have went to the Major League Baseball. Um, yeah. And he waited really until, I believe, like 10 days before the draft to officially say, hey, I'm, 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 I'm dedicated to NFL. So it's hard to read the kid, and um, he needs to get more better advice because this is not – at all making him look good. Mm-hmm. I think if it if it wasn't for the work stoppage in MLB right now, there'd be a lot of rumors about Kyler potentially leaving the NFL to play baseball. I think at this point, he just knows he's not going to get the guaranteed money that guys like Josh Allen are going to get. Um, and in baseball, with I mean, he was a high round draft pick. Like he would have made more money just signing his oh, name, yeah. on, on, just signing his name on the dotted line. Kyler makes more money playing zero games of baseball than he has in his entire football career. Um, that's how talented he is in that sport. Um, and just the way that they pay their players. I mean, obviously there's more money for a guy like Kyler in baseball than there is for a quarterback of his ability. Like, but it's more, it's more steps though. And someone brought this to my attention because you got to start off class one, you're right. You work your way up to class, double a triple a. And by the time you get Not to the always. Major, well, always, yeah, unless, always, you're, unless Jason, you're that talented, good. You're, you're right, though, Jason. That. You're yeah. he, you're 100 correct. Nobody goes straight to the major yeah. leagues. They're gonna, they're gonna have a cup of tea somewhere in the minor leagues. Um, but the point I want to to make though is if you get drafted high in the first round mm-hmm. in MLB, that signing bonus is 
about as big as that five million he makes to play quarterback. Hmm. So even if he doesn't make it to major league baseball, even if he stays in the minor leagues for four or five years, he'll make bank with that first or second round contract. He'll make it regardless, yeah. Yeah. So he'll be fine until you know that next contract in baseball comes. That's the hmm. one where it's like, okay, if he's not having success, then maybe the money's gonna fade. But I think that initial contract in, in baseball sounds real juicy to him right now. Yeah. I mean, injury prone, you know, with him being injury prone too, mm -hmm. it's like, man, like take away the contact. Like, yeah. Yeah. There'd be a lot of benefit for him going baseball. Right. And to go back to what we were saying about the comparison between him and Baker Mayfield, they won the Heisman trophy in back to back years of each other. They were both (laughs) the number one overall pick in back to back years. So, and they both went to Oklahoma. So they're always going to be linked no matter what, because it's like, okay, Lincoln Riley did this with Baker Mayfield. So he's going to do it with uh, Kyler. Kyler mm-hmm. Little or Little. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Kyler has definitely has more ability. He threatens you in, in a different kind of way than Baker. But yeah, Baker's bigger than him. So yeah, he is. It's like 5'8 right. like or 5'9. So. Yeah. But here's the other thing, too. And, like, you're right. He was a high pick in the MLB draft. He was drafted to play for the Oakland A's. And it took him. And that's a good team. Like, <laughs> First round. Yeah. Think number 11 overall, yeah. if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. I know it was between 10 and 20. And that's, ones, right? that's the first. You know, the first NFL player to ever be drafted first round in NFL as well as Major League Baseball. Uh, yep. we, you know, they had players that played multiple sports, but he the first to get first round in both. Yep. But there's right things right. that he probably wouldn't like, which is riding with the general public on the bus rides when you're in <laughs> Class A, you know. Well, that's, those part type of things. Reason, that's part of the reason there's a work stoppage now. You know, a lot of the the minor league teams and the way that they're treated and their charters are figured out and stuff like that. That's all stuff that's on the table right now. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, if it wasn't a terrible time for baseball, I it think Tyler would be, I think he'd be flirting with, with potentially just saying, screw the NFL. I'm, I'm gone. I mean, another quarterback who thought about going to baseball at one point was Russell Wilson. Cause yep. he got drafted. Did, I want to say two or three times in the MLB draft because with the MLB draft, it's like you have the option to go back to high school or go back to college and then re-enter the draft. It's a weird dynamic with that. I I don't know all the intricacies of it off the top of my head, so I'm not going to try and explain it. Yeah, but, baseball weird. Yeah. But it's like... Russell Wilson doesn't appear to be happy in Seattle either. So yeah, one day it's like one week they're happy, next week they're beefing. It's always something, man, and it, it it shows that the quarterback is starting to become the new wide receiver as far as the prima donna of the locker room. You're right about that, that, yeah. yeah. You're right about that. I mean, quarterback used to be a position where, I, I mean, it was just a bunch of stiff white guys, you know. And now <laughs> it's like these these younger guys that are coming into the league are like, I mean, they're NBA talent, like athletic-wise, athletic, athletic wise, you know what I mean? And it's like, we're not used to seeing that. Even guys like Josh Allen, like, you know, for being a big ah. – Dude, he's a freak athlete. Oh, like, yeah, these, absolutely. These kids that are playing quarterback now in high school – you know, they're the best athletes on the team. Whereas before, like Josh, you were saying wide receiver was the prima donna position. Like mm-hmm. guys wanted to score touchdowns, but now it's like quarterback gets all the love, you know? So a right. lot, of, a lot of different type of athletes are interested in playing quarterback now. And that's why I think that the game has evolved so much um, just because the, the quarterback plays better now than it's ever been. They can hit less me first team second. It's I mean it, it, it's the ideal position to play if you if you're talented enough. So you get to wear the red jersey during practice, you mm-hmm. know, and yeah. in the games mm-hmm. the way the refs call. I mean, this year was ref ball. It, <laughs> that's how I viewed it. It was like flag penalty for celebrating. It's like what this no is the no fun league now. 
Yep. That's what I think NFL now stands for. It's not National Football League anymore. It's now the No Fun League. Yeah, it is. You can't even touch the quarter. Like it's the rules is just so it's so in the offense's favor. It, it's to the point where it, it, let's say you are a six round uh, player or walk on. You play defense and you're trying to make a living for your family, and you just happen to hit a wide receiver that drops down and you can't control how they drop, but you hit them and you're fine 20,000. That's a lot of money to that person versus a quarterback. So it's like the defense is just really at a disadvantage, man. It's not fair. Right. And like, like what I was saying back on our post game Super Bowl show, it was like for a majority of that game, the referees put down their whistles. They, put the penalty flags in the in their back pockets and they just let the let the Rams and Bengals play and decide who was the best team and then all of a sudden in like the final 6 minutes it was like a flag on every other play mm-hmm. and i'm just like you can't do that mm-hmm. because i think i'm not again i'm not going to start a conspiracy theory or make formal accusations, but you can't totally blame me in thinking that the refs helped decide the winner of Su- of Super Bowl 56. It's possible, man. The, re- the refs got an influence. The refs, even with when Donnie, he wrote that tell-all book about how he was paid off by the mob to call mm-hmm. games. They, at a split second, they could change either one of the team's fortune. Exactly. They got a lot of input in that. Yeah, you're talking about prima donnas, too. I don't know why, but referees seems to be a prima donna. Yeah, player. like they're better they're than the players. players. Yeah, like it, it's all about the referees. It's, mm-hmm. like they, it's gotta, just about being in the spotlight and wanting to control the game and have some kind of power over it. And I, It's a trip, man, seeing some of these referees and how like their their heads just get so bloated. It's like – the best referees are the ones that you don't notice are there. Right. Yeah. It's, do your job. <laughs> it's your job. Yep. Yeah. It's like if the three of us like bought tickets to go see the Browns play against the Ravens, for example, we went to see Browns Ravens. Mm-hmm. We did not go to see the people wearing zebra clothing. Mm-hmm. Sorry. There's so many of them on the damn field at a time now that it's like you get more people to potentially throw a flag. So mm-hmm. the odds of a penalty on each play go up just by having more refs. Like, exactly. Like, yeah, some three back judges and two front judges and an umpire and a referee, assistant referee, assistant umpire. It's like, who gives a shit, man? Like, What's, it, the, what's the name of the guy where they're watching the game and they always get his advice? Like, hey, oh, uh, the, the sky judge. It's like, dude, like – his opinion doesn't matter. It's not going to change anything. I'm frankly, I'm tired of it. Yeah, I need to get rid of that. <laughs> the other annoying part too is like when a play is happening and the referees decide, nope, we're going to blow the whistle and blow it dead. And it's like we're we're going to review the previous play. It's like what the the next play is already happening. Like sometimes they do get that in. They'll challenge it. But the team trying to be slick and trying to hurry up and yeah, that's what happened. Actually, my first Browns game. Fun little fact about me: my first ever Browns game was Bottlegate, and that's oh wow, <laughs> oh really? Yep, that's did exactly you throw a bottle? Yeah, yeah, did, did, oh yeah, I, th- I threw something. I don't remember. I was so young, but I was there with my dad, and yeah, it was wild. But yeah, that's what happened. Was that you know we went and we kicked the extra point. And then after the ball goes through the uprights, there all of a sudden the referee saying, "No, I blew my whistle. The play was dead. We're going to review it." Then they go and review it, and they overturn Northcutt's touchdown. That was some BS, and we didn't and even yeah. hear a whistle. And that it was like there was there was no whistle, like no. But because of the stupid process or whatever, it was just like man, like yeah, it, that was one of those cases where it was like referees just doing too much. It's like man, yeah. Um, so I think I might have asked you that guys, this question before, but like when it comes to just attending a sporting event, 
let's okay since we're all football fans i'll just stick with the nfl okay do you guys have a team that like i really want to see the browns play this team at home like for me it was when the Browns played the Seahawks in 2019 in Cleveland. I'm like, I really want to go to that game because I want to see the Browns play the Seahawks. Do you guys have a team like that where you're like? Mine changes year to year. Okay. Yeah. Usually it's like a, if there's a, a good player on the other team that I like, you know, I, I'll go see one of them. Or, But when it comes to just like a blank schedule, like Steelers games are always my favorite to go to. Like that, I'll tell you this. That home oh. game against the Steelers, no matter how bad we are or how good they are or vice versa, it's always electric. I love those games. So it's the okay. Steelers and then basically my favorite players, whoever my favorite players are playing for. I like the um, – I, you know, personally, I like to watch games at home because of just of, of the other technical things. But um, if I did have to choose, I would like to see the Chargers. Mm. I'm intrigued by Justin Herbert and mm. just his ability. Play. Like, I, I want to see that live and just see, am I tripping when I watch these highlights and watch them in game? Or is this guy what the film says he is? Because I... Of course, I believe the film says he is good, but mm-hmm. I would like to see the Chargers because it just seemed like an interesting game. Anytime I mean, we play them. You'll you'll get that opportunity this season because the Browns and Chargers are going to play each other here in Cleveland. Oh, really? Yeah. So are we going? Mm-hmm. <laughs> we should. The We're Chargers, going. In, in all of sports, the Chargers are my favorite branding. I love their colors. I love the logo. I love everything about it. I, they just nail it. Everything about their uniforms. It's just out of the park. So I, I always visually like the Chargers games just because it's like, it's so appealing to me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I put them on that list of teams that I'd like to see every year. Um, just for that reason alone, it's just like, yeah. I, I've always really loved them. Like when the Browns, because I'm old enough to remember when the Browns weren't around and I had to root for other teams. Um, like I, I hate to admit this now, I was a cowboy fan. But, <laughs> oh, I'm so uh, sorry. But yeah, I, was also, I, I, yeah. I was also a big Charger fan, and it was just I like the uniforms, I like the helmets, you know. Yeah, I told you guys this during my during our Super Bowl show. My all time favorite player is the Damian Tomlin said, mm-hmm. which um, you guys were both extremely shocked about. Yeah. I it was just a play, the way he handled the playoffs and stuff hurt, but. Mm. Yeah, he's still great. He's a Hall of Fame talent. He was a dog, and he like there was something about him. Like he was one of the first running backs to wear the dark visor too. Yeah, like, he it would was just dope. come out, and he just looked so scary. Like dope. he was just like he was the combination of power and speed that was just like so rare. You know what I mean? Like yeah, fantasy football guy. Yeah, running backs are usually one or the other. You know, they're Derrick Henry type or they're uh, uh, a Barry Sanders type. You know, it's like there's two different styles. And LT kind of combined those two. I was was just going to say that. He could lower his head and run you over. Like, he can run a dive with the best of them. But he's also, like, on a counter play, he's going to juke you out of your shoes. He's Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's one of my favorite players all time, too. I want to give you all just a true story, just real quick. Um, So, when the Browns did leave – and we were forced to choose other teams. Mm-hmm. And I hate admitting this, but I, 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 at one time in my life as a teenager, young and dumb, I rolled with the Steelers. And okay. this guy from my class gave get me that a, brown a head off your head now. No, I, no, I, I this is true. Had to, I make this up. Come on, Josh, you weren't there. You don't I had a terrible we time. Had to on. I bought a terrible towel home. My father. The hurt, the anguish he had. He like, man, it was one of those like, what is you what doing, hell, bro? man? You know, son of mine. <laughs> I felt bad. So I'm like, well, they're from the ASC North. He yeah. like, no, it ain't about that. And mm-hmm. ever since then, I burned that flag. And there you go. But yeah, man, we was forced to make decisions, and that was mine, unfortunately. Yeah, okay, my so favorite, it's... my favorite athlete of all time, hands down, any sport is Deion Sanders. And Ooh, as a good kid, choice. As a kid, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to hit home runs and I wanted to score touchdowns. That's what I wanted as a kid. And so, like, Bo Jackson. Yeah, he he was just a guy that, like, even though he was a defensive player, he always found himself in the end zone. You know, he was so good on special teams, so many pick sixes, like, 
So I, I'm embarrassed to say I was a Cowboys fan, but it was all about Dion. Yeah. Um, if he would have been with the Falcons still, I would have been a Falcons fan. So. Yeah. So, Jason, it's actually interesting that you brought up that story about the terrible towel because mm. my dad and I, back when Johnny Manziel was still the Browns quarterback, we decided to actually go to Pittsburgh mm. and attend Brown Steelers. He now, won that game, didn't he? No, oh, the Steelers. No, I killed oh, wait, Johnny Manziel yeah. beat the Steelers once, didn't he? Here. Yeah, that's right. It was yeah. at Okay, okay. But okay. go on, Josh. Sorry, I thought that was the game he won. No. No, the Steelers absolutely blew us out of the water. Mm-hmm. It was back in 2015 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, when I visit another team's I was state- <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not going to do a full game recap. No, <laughs> no, it was it was 2015, and I'm like, where was I in 2015? Josh. <laughs> and I said, oh, I was in, I was in rehab, <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't for my shoulder. <laughs> okay, that's why I don't remember that particular game. I got it. Anyway, go on, go on with the story. Fun fact. Anyway, so when I go to another team stadium, I like to call get some piece of memorabilia or something that makes sense yeah to remember that stadium so when i was in heinz field naturally what did my mind think of the terrible towel Mm -hmm. and that that's the only reason i wanted it was just as a memento for going to heinz field Mm -hmm. and my dad was like hell no you are not buying a terrible towel like that is forbidden, and I'm like, well, okay then. I have two towels in my golf bag. One of them's a Cleveland Browns towel, and that's the one I use to wipe off my clubs after they're cleaned, <laughs> or, or after I wash my ball, I dry it off with that towel. Now, when it's a, a rainy day and I've got mud caked on my lob wedge, that's a clean. terrible towel, and I just <laughs> wipe it off. <laughs> And get that yellow nasty towel nice and brown, and then I throw it in the bag. Keep it clean. Uh, yeah. Okay. And that's how they're used. So, based off of this conversation, you're probably not going to like what I'm about to say, but I have this hypothetical brand new AFC North. Okay. okay. I'll entertain it. Why not? It's the off season. Let's hear okay. it. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, all for it. Total, this is totally hypothetical. The NFL is not actually considering realigning the divisions or anything like that. Obviously, in my new AFC North, the Browns are going to be in it. However, I am kicking out Cincinnati, Baltimore, and Pittsburgh. Hmm. And here's who I'm replacing them with. The Indianapolis Colts the Minnesota Vikings, and the Detroit Lions. I like one of those. I, I like the idea of playing Detroit every year. Yeah, but, Detroit. But, like, Josh, like, I know you're young. But there's <laughs> so much history between the Browns and the Steelers and the Browns and the Bengals. And the, Ra- and the Ravens. And the Ravens now, too. But it, you get, like, when you get rid of all three of those teams, you lose all three of those rivalries. Yeah. yeah. Might as well just blow up the whole conference. If if there is some kind of theoretical realignment, God forbid there's another pandemic and we have another season where they do, you know, some kind of geographical changes, Josh. That's it's geographically, it makes perfect sense. So I like what I like what your where your head's at with it, but it would just as a Browns fan who really loves the history, because let's be honest, the the present and the more recent history with the Browns hasn't been good. So those old, old memories of us winning back in the 50s and 60s, I like those. Yeah. I want to hold on to those. Okay, so I don't know what just happened to Jason, but anyway. He'll be back. Um, What I – it's not that I'm ignoring the history that we have with those teams. I just thought it would be fun to come up with something new and just hear your reaction on that. And – that's the only reason I oppose it. Uh, like I said, geographically, it makes perfect sense and they're good matchups. You know, those are exciting teams to, to play. So, yeah. I don't uh, dislike it. I just, I would hate to see us lose those rivalry games. As yeah. Well. I understand that. Yeah. Um, there are two primary reasons I would bring in those three teams. Um, 
First, I would love to see the Browns and Colts play each other every year. I The last couple times we've played them, it, they've been close games that have been really exciting. I actually looked this up. That's been the case since we've played them since, every year since 1992. Mm-hmm. And also, it feels like the last couple times we've played them, there's been a bit of a rivalry developing between the Browns and Colts based on – like from my perspective, I'm sure you don't quite see it the same way, but I just feel like it would be fun to see the Browns and Colts play each other twice a year. And then with the Vikings, I just feel like the Browns and Vikings play very similar styles of football. And yeah, we got a 14 to seven score with them this season, but Generally, you're not going to get that low scoring of a game. Mm -hmm. But I just think that would be a fun matchup. And then the only reason I threw Detroit in there is because I just feel like Detroit would give us some, give us a different element. The Browns, Vikings, and Colts are all kind of that run the ball, ground and pound type of style. Whereas Detroit, on the other hand, they. I don't see them as that type of football team. I see them as like a throw first mentality and then run the ball off of that. So having them in this new AFC North would just present something different. Definitely be different. I'll give you that. Again, I'm still not there. Never going to happen. I know. Too much stuff. But what's happening now? This is what I'm intrigued about. What's happening with the Cavs? Okay. It's, it's still like ever since that All Star break, I don't know who this team is that I'm seeing on. We've been we've been doing uncharacteristic things. I don't want to take a victory lap on you guys, but I'm about to take a victory lap on you. Guys. Go ahead. Go ahead. I know where you're going with this, too. Because <laughs> when we went into the All-Star break, I we had this conversation, and we, we were on a little bit of a skid. You know, we had made we had a loss to a team that we shouldn't have lost to. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were giving up. We were giving up. Yep, Detroit. And we were giving up leads late. Uh, we were also getting blown out out of the gates, too, in some of those games. Uncharacteristic stuff. But I said – this is what happens when you have a team that is dramatically overachieving and then they get hit by a bunch of injuries, Mm. Um, man, like as a young team that was, that, that had the injuries that we have to the key players that we have. And and especially considering that our, our guards are getting injured and that was already a position of need for us was that the guard. So I, I said, I warned you guys, I could see us probably in the next, couple couple weeks to a month leveling out more towards that five six range and i think that's what's happening now yeah so i just want to clarify that even though i got really i'm for sure i got overhyped by what we did to start the season and all that i'm not afraid to admit that but even with that i never expected us to be like in the mix for the number one the number two or the number three seed. I mean, I, we thought it was crazy to even consider making the regular postseason, not the play-in tournament. Like yeah. To, to be one through six, I mean, I think we agreed that would be crazy before the season the started. Right. Yeah, we did agree on that. And um, that was before the Rubio trade and some things happened. So, to be fair on us, you know, the team looked a little different at the time. So Right. And, I mean, I predicted 30 wins, but that's based off – how I saw them ending the season where I saw some good things. So I'm like, okay, 30 wins is a reasonable number. Yeah. But uh, here's what I don't want to happen. I want the Cavs to stay in the four to six range. I don't want them to fall into that. Same. Play, yeah. The play in tournament, because for me, I, Brian, I think you view it the same way. The play-in tournament is not the playoffs. It's just, hey, here's a participation trophy. Like It's like that certificate where it's like, you participated. Only one team in that tournament is a playoff team, and it's the one that wins it. Right. The other three teams, they're not playoff teams. I mean, play- mm-hmm. I mean the play-in tournament determines who's the number seven seed and the number eight seed. 
but it's not the postseason. Well, it is the postseason. It's not the playoffs. Exactly. Let me play devil's advocate, though. In Major League Baseball, there's the play-in, the wild card. That's what they call it. But it's technically the playoffs. And if you are eliminated, your season is over with. But if you win, your season continues. I don't see how that couldn't be considered the playoffs. Yeah, I get what you're saying, and I understand that, that there's definitely an opposing argument. I just think, in my opinion, there's too many teams in the NBA postseason. Mm-hmm. So a lot of those teams that are going to be in that play-in tournament are not going to yeah. be good basketball teams. Yeah, like, they make a bad teams, draft pick. A bad teams in those groups. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why I don't want to fall there either, because I don't want to be one of those bad teams. You know, I, I, I want to believe in this team, but we need everybody to get healthy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The postseason. Um, because March is about to be brutal. We This schedule we have this month is insane. Man. Um, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Like, 500 this month, I'd be happy. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, with, 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 with the injuries we have and guys that we're just starting to get back, like Garland just now getting healthy again, um, you know, we're waiting for Levert. You know, we still haven't seen the fruits of that trade. because What's up with Levert? Is he in? Like, what, what, what's going sprain. on? I think it was ankle sprain. Yeah, sprain ankle, if yeah. I remember correctly. But here's the other problem. Like, if I look at the schedule, like, we have Philadelphia tomorrow. We you would Oh, wow. <laughs> in Philadelphia. And, like, and Josh, oh, the, the other thing I want to point out, too, you said you don't want to slip into that, that seven through – 10 range. Um, we're only a game and a half out of that. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. a game and a half ahead of Toronto, who is the seven seed. Right. So By we're the way, we're we, a couple games away from being in that play. Right. So that yeah. the game on March 6th, when we host Toronto, by the way, that game is going to be on ESPN. So that just adds That's a massive to, game. Yeah. That game is massive. But You know, you touched on Garland earlier, Brian. Here's my problem. If he was injured, why did he play in the Taco Bell Skills Challenge? Why did he play in the actual All-Star game? It's like, dude, like that, I'm sorry, because I'm as big of a Cavs fan as anyone. Like, I'm wearing my arm sling, and I'm still wearing a goddamn Cavs shirt, even after we got smashed by the Charlotte Hornets last night. Yeah, Um, that's a fair. Yeah, that's a fair question. It's like Garland, like you have a back injury, yet you're playing, participating in All Star stuff. Something's not adding up there. I I can't do the full hand motion that I want to right now. But (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I think it's management, man. I think leadership. I think they look at it as more of a, we already lost Sexton. We're not about to lose you. And we look like we're on the verge of getting to the playoffs. So we're going to low manage you without saying that. So your back spasms or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. But I think this is coming from up top. So let me ask you this. Right now, we, for the most part, we've had a successful season. If if Colin Sexton wasn't injured, do you think we would be having the same amount of success or do you think we would be having less or do you think we might be having more success? I think it, well, you know, originally I thought it would, they wouldn't have clicked like this with him on the court because he would have been trying to still get all the shots and all. But if you remember at the beginning of the season, he started falling in line. So he was okay with being the two guard. And I'm kind of interested to see how he will play with this core because I know he'll make certain shots that we're missing right now. You know, so I'm kind of intrigued. Like, I I think we'll still be the same, but I do think he still helps us because he is a good player. So I'm intrigued, man. What do you think, Brian? Uh, to me, this this draws parallels to the uh, Ronald Acuna injury for the Atlanta Braves. Um, Explain. That injury to Acuna forced the Braves to reimagine their outfield. Um, they had to sign some players, and they made mm-hmm. some moves. And we know what happened. Those moves inspired a run from a young team 
uh, that ended up going mm-hmm. on to to make it to the World Series. So and win the World Series and win exactly. So crazy too. Yeah. When Alan Sexton goes down, what do we do? We make a move for Ricky Rubio. Uh, <sighs> you know, so it's like we start clicking. Um, these pieces got a guy like Levert. We wouldn't have brought him in. Um, so it's like. I think a lot of the the moves that we've made and the way that we've assembled this team was built around his injury. So yes. I think that him going down made this team better from from a, a a roster perspective. But I also know he's a super talented guy. You know, I mean, there's a place for him somewhere. In a, you know, in a starting five, I just don't know if it's on this team. I don't know if with Garland playing like he plays. And uh, Lavert, if he comes back and, and plays like we hope he will, I just don't I don't see where he fits in. Just think if if he if he had the 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 professionalism where he's okay with coming off the bench, and we would be able to just have him come off as the sixth man, and then close these games out. Man, like that would help, and I think both parties win. But I don't know if he's built that way. But even that sixth man role, we've got a guy right now who's might be the sixth man of the you year. Guys. Yeah, we've got two people that are competing for that sixth man of the year position already. So, you know, what happens to those guys? You know exactly. what I mean? Because their minutes, get, you know, we're cutting into those minutes now. True. So, True. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm kind of on the fence about it. Like, I, I want, like, I, I like Colin Sexton. I want him to do well. I, I want him to succeed. And, but at the end of the day, what I want more than anything is for the Cavs to end up back in the finals. And I, whatever's going to be best for the team is what I want. And in my, you know, opinion, I think that it might be best if he moves on. If we so, Josh, yes, is it better for the Cavs to? I guess because I think technically we got him under contract for one more year. Should we hold on to him and wait until All Star break, see how he jails with the team, and then put a trigger in because. I would believe his trade value is probably high, as high as level now mm-hmm. versus if he doesn't do good next season. That's the worry. What if uh, he comes back and he kind of stinks, you know, then you're mm-hmm. all that trade value for him. So no, here's my thing. It's like, we, I feel like we've seen enough on film and on the court from Garland and Sexton to know that for, for whatever reason, they don't work well together. I, I don't, I think it's mostly because Sexton is so ball dominant Mm -hmm. and it's like, it causes not just Garland, but it causes the other players to Mm -hmm. just stand around and wait for something to happen. Whereas whereas if you watch Garland, the guys are cutting and they're call, they're posting up and calling for the ball. Like, Hey, I have position. Like we've seen the, the connection between Jared Allen and Darius Garland blossom this season. It's chem- the chemistry. Great. Exactly. Yeah. So my worry is if we bring Sexton back, that chemistry that we have as a team, not just with the starting lineup, but as a team, is going to become off balance because even when Garland's not on the floor – you still see that same type of free flowing off. Mm-hmm. He's moving and cutting in and out and trying to get in the best position. Everybody know they roll. Exactly. So my concern is when Sexton comes back, he's going to revert back into that role of dribble. He's going to go into like James Harden, mm-hmm. Houston Rockets mode, where it's like. Dribble, 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 dribble. And my rat tail, my rat tail is swinging while I'm dribbling all the time. <laughs> like, what is that? Okay, there's a couple interesting <laughs> interviews on this team. Like, I, I said this last night while watching the Hornets absolutely blow us out of the water. It looks like Darius Garland is growing a broccoli farm on his head. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all right, man, I'm going to be candid. All of their hairstyles, maybe I'm showing my age, but it just looks bizarre. Look like um, <laughs> what's the dude from the from the Simpsons? They used to have a <laughs> side shot Bob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I don't know what the hell going on, but that rat tail until Sexton cut that rat tail off, 
I don't think he's gonna be. I don't think it's gonna it's gonna mesh. <laughs> yeah, and, and just because you have a great number one and you have a great number two doesn't mean you have a one and a two who can be great together. Um, let's take a look at uh, Portland, uh, two guys who were great players in Dame Lillard and uh, CJ McCollum. Mm -hmm. They just never won anything. They, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, they, fairly though. It reminds me a little bit, you know, a Garland and Sexton combo feels a little bit like that. It feels like, yeah, both of those guys are really good, but it doesn't fit for whatever reason. It's not a winning combination. Whereas this combination of Garland and everybody that he's this playing works. with. This <laughs> you know I mean? I'm not saying the guys he's playing with are better than Colin Sexton, but he plays better with these guys. So it's a give and take, you know. Here's my po – pushback about your comparison to Dame and CJ though. It felt like every year one of them would get injured either close to the playoffs or during the playoffs. And so we never actually got to see them together. I feel that. I'm familiar, right? Yeah, I feel that. Yeah. Injury situation. You never really see them together because one of them's always hurt. Right. So I that sounds real familiar. Yes, so, I do. But what I'm saying is I don't think you can – I get what you're saying, Brian, and I and I think it is valid. But by the same token, I don't think you can make that comparison because we never got to see CJ and Dame really become what I think they could have been. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I, for me, that, that feels like you're strengthening my argument because we're looking at Colin Sexton and Garland, and one of them is hurt all the time they we never really see these two together and it's like how long will that continue to happen will it be every year so it's i'm, like, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna pull a brian move i agree with you brian and i agree with you Josh, because i see both of you guys argue me like y'all both guys serious but on real y'all have valid y'all both got valid arguments and um i think only time would tell you know like i wish i had a a better response to it but y'all got great excellent Okay, can we just take a moment to, to admire this? First, we got Josh and Knees on the show, and now we have Floyd, <laughs> and now we have Floyd O'Brien. Juvenized. Juvenized. <laughs> Juvenized. <laughs> Brian, <laughs> Jason, you got to figure something out. Uh. You got to figure out what your element is in this. Because right. we got we got Bryant's, we have <laughs> I don't know, but I tell you this: what I don't know, and I need to know, is the eight. So, it's the revolution is coming up, right? Yes, sir. I don't know, I, and I know a lot of our viewers isn't that savvy when it comes to wrestling. But why don't you tell us what's going on? Because there's a big date coming up. Oh yes. Oh, wait, I said that wrong. Oh, hell yeah. There you go. <laughs> if you can't tell, I am fucking excited about this. Um, right. Tell us what's what's coming. Oh, my God. This is the first pay-per-view of the year for AEW. It is called Revolution. And good Lord, do they have a spectacular card. I, I'm going to try and, like... I'm not going to go through and describe why every match is happening because that would just take way too long. Just the microwave version. Yeah. Okay. So, God, how to condense this? Or tell us the main, the main fight, the main bouts. Okay, so like you, you have got ten minutes. Oh God, <laughs> I, there's no way I can condense this into ten minutes. There, Who should I be watching for? Oh my God, matches to watch. Um, you got. Well, Jason, you and I were watching this in class today. Yeah. Hey, you got CM Punk against MJF in a dog collar match. What a jerk. Like, this is MK, dude. Like, oh, MJF? <laughs> MJF, I'm sorry. Yeah. He's such a jerk. Like, uh, 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 I'm rich. You people are beneath me. Uh, we're the real scumbag, but continue, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he, he is so good. Like, there's certain wrestlers where it's like they're good on the microphone, but they suck when it comes to wrestling or being 
when it comes to being in the matches or it's like they're really good in the ring, but then they suck on the microphone. And so it's rare to have both of those qualities, huh? I feel like, yeah, it is. That's interesting. Yeah. Whereas, M- but MJF does a great job on both. It's like when you, when he speaks, you have some sort of reaction. And for most people, it's, you know, boo. or So he's a villain. He's a villain. Yes. yes. Okay. Or like when he was having his promo battle with CM Punk in Chicago, because Chicago is CM Punk's hometown, you heard what the crowd would say. Shut the fuck up. Shut the <laughs> fuck up. It was, and his response was, no. <laughs> he controlled the crowd. Exactly. So you have that match. What the hell is a dog collar match? Can you explain that first? Yes. So it's they're literally going to have like a dog collar wrapped around their necks and a chain in between them. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, so they can't separate from each other. No. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. so how long is the chain by any chance? I don't know. I it seems so dangerous. It, so they could choke somebody with this. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, yeah. I don't know about this one. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's so many good matches on the card. I don't want to disrespect any by not mentioning them. Um, you got the world title match, the world title match between Hangman, Adam Page, and the number one contender, Adam Cole. You got... Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, against Thunder Rosa for the Women's Championship. You have Chris Jericho against Eddie Kingston and Brian Danielson against John Moxley. Jade Cargill defends the TBS Championship against Ty Conti. Um, is my guy playing? Is my guy Max Caster? Is he going to be in it? No. Oh, man. Oh, man. No. Yeah. I'm a fan of his. Yeah. Unfortunately, Max is not part of it. Um, okay. And there's several. There's a few other matches that I'm leaving off because, you know, we're kind of on time constraints. But oh my god, this it's gonna be amazing. What time? What time it, begins? Like, how can we tune in? Um, so you can get it on pay per view through cable, um, Fight TV, I think internationally or something. Bleacher Report. Um, it starts at eight o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I, I don't know why I just went so specific there, but whatever. No, you should be. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, um, and it's gonna be fantastic. There's a pre-show that you can watch on the AEW YouTube channel. They're gonna have a couple matches on that. But oh my god, I I can't even do this match. This card justice. It's it's gonna be absolutely spectacular. I don't Where, huh? Where is it at? Is it is it gonna be in um California or Orlando. Orlando, okay. Yeah, it's gonna be at addition. Let me see if I can remember the name of it. I think Down it's in Disneyland. Additional financial arena. Mm. What for some reason, AEW does not go to like the big arenas, like the NBA, NHL arenas. They tend to go to the smaller arenas, right. uh, probably because they're only three years old. So the contracts, probably WWE trying to monopolize it. Yeah. 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 But here's the interesting part: when they do their next pay per view, Double or Nothing, in Las Vegas. They are going to be do that show at the Vegas Golden Knights Arena, T-Mobile Arena, where like the US oh, okay. has their big pay-per-views and like stuff like that, which there is a big UFC pay-per-view this weekend, but we can save that for a different time. <laughs> so there's a lot going on, basically, man. Yeah. March 6th is going to be fun because first you got – NBA Finals rematch between Phoenix and Milwaukee in Milwaukee where the Bucks won it. And then after that, you have the Raptors are playing the Cavaliers on ESPN. Scotty Barnes is good. That's a rookie for Toronto. Watch him. Oh, yeah. 
And then, and we talked about how mon- how important that game is. Mm-hmm. And then at eight o'clock that night, it's AEW Revolution. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be tuned in for that for sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's the um, that's the producers wrapping this up. Um, I gotta right. get out the studio now because someone else has time. Uh, but. Great conversation, guys. Man, this was very good, very needed. Yeah, good show, guys. It was enjoyable as always. And yep. we will see you same time, same place next Thursday. Yep. And tune in, knuckleheads. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tony Kornheiser, shut out. Yeah. Peace, y'all. Tony Kornheiser out here on the sports channels. Please. Peace, y'all. Peace.